where they come on a bus from State Road and they go to work with, with the sanitation unit or filling potholes or, or, or trimming trees and working in our parks and rec. Uh, they do it in Chicago. Bayer Daly uh, started that program a number of years ago. And he calls them my people. They're my guys. They're my people. And, and I am committed to, to making that effort to, to change and re, and re, re change the, the cycle of this whole particular problem. Because in the end, not only is it the moral thing to do, it's the smart thing to do because these folks are going to be taxpayers at some point in time. And it's the smart thing to do because I don't have to house as many people behind bars and pay for them as we do now. That money can go to education. And that's the other piece of this. Uh, we need pre-K for every third, three and four year old in the city. And access to pre-K is not universal here. And the city needs to provide with the with the, the, instant, the corporate world, with the Chamber of Commerce, with Penn, with Drexel, with all those institutions to step up and put together a pot of money to get three or four year olds be able to read by the time they get to first grade, second grade. So they're not the teachers are dealing with them in a remedial way. Because what happens is if you don't can't read in the third grade, in seventh and eighth grade you're acting up, and in ninth and tenth grade you're dropping out, and then you're on that path that I want to keep them off of that path. So it's a two-pronged approach. One is on the front end, making sure the kids have the things that they need to succeed in school. And on the back end, those who have made mistakes in our life who are coming home, come home. And we will, we will do our best to make sure you don't go back. And that's my message to you. And that's my commitment to this process. And, and any questions you have, I'd be happy to, be happy to answer. Yeah. Yes, sir. <laughs> Give me your assessment of, of the city's uh, approach. Well, to I, return a citizen to rise uh, I, I, program, and, and specifically, uh, do you have job data on how many folks have got the job to rise? No, I don't, but I will give you a, an example of a rise, a rise example that was to me, I just shook my head and said, uh, I can't remember. <clears throat> I had a guy who was, got, he was a white collar crime, he had committed a white collar crime, and he was in federal prison. And he was a IT specialist, he had, he had great IT skills, uh, and he was very good at what he did. But he couldn't get and it couldn't get past the interview. He couldn't get past the application, and that's when, in council, when we passed a number of years ago, ban the box. I was a strong supporter of Don Miller's effort to do that because you know as well as I do when the box is checked and it's read, it gets put in the trash can, and there's no interview. So this this young man was having and he had experience, he had skills, and he had a work history, and he could not get by the first interview because of his because of his his record. And I must have made 50 calls to different corporate. Uh, human resource personnel, people, presidents of companies, just do me a favor, give this guy a chance, give this guy a chance. So I sent him over to Rise, and he took his resume with him, and they called him, and they wanted him to go to the Lincoln Financial Field and clean up after an Eagles game. Now, I think that if that's what you can do, that's what you can do to make ends meet, but when you have a person who has skills and don't need to be trained, and you send them to clean up the stadium, you're not really looking further than the stadium. Um, so I think that we need to, we need to look for, for job opportunities, and it's got to be the mayor's responsibility to make the contacts with the Chamber of Commerce folks and with people who own companies and run companies in order to say that, do the same thing that I did with my guy when he, was, when he was a teenager and then when he was a young adult. Take a chance on this person. I know them. I know them, and I know if you give them a chance, they will get better, and they will, they will succeed. But it's got to be it's got to be a personal effort on part of the mayor with the business community to say you have to help us with this because it's in our best interest. Now there are some industries where we're not going to be able to get help. There are certain federal requirements, banking re banking requirements, child care, things of that nature that we may just preclude us from having any success. But we can have success in, in jobs where people don't need a college education, or we can have success in getting people into in the community college programs that will provide them certifications and things that they need to be more job marketable. But, but sending, sending a guy with IT skills to the link for cleanup to me is just not, not helping anybody. And if he, they did that with him, I don't know what they're doing with everybody else. But I do not have statistics right now in front of me to tell you what the, what the answer to that is. First and foremost, congratulations to you for being here. Thank you. I appreciate That's great. My name is Lionel Articus. I've been on the state. Like that IT professional you were speaking about, I used to own a staffing company. So the whole band of box, yes, it gets put into the trash immediately. So that program should never have been even been instituted. It was always the top. Right. Secondly, like that IT professional, I have a skill set that I can't get past HR. Okay. I used to be in HR. I was an external part of HR. Right. I'm sure you understand it. 
So the reality is this, what are you going to do for that IT professional that really needs to go out and become a consultant and start his own business? What is the city going to offer in the way of grant money or assistance to help this person make their own way? We know how to fish, okay? But if you're going to take all the fish out the pond, I still can't eat. Right. Right. And just like that professional, if I were to rise, it would have been a waste of my time. Right. Because for me, I talk to people at Rise. I made way more money than the people who run Rise. So what exactly is the city of Philadelphia, and if you are put into a position of power, going to do for the small entrepreneur who's trying to come from a setback? I sat on State Road tutoring people anywhere from 20 to, to their 50s who can't do a fraction, can't write a paragraph, but the law has stipulated that this person needs to find a job. They're set up for failure. The public school system has already failed them out of the gate. And I, and I understand that you, you're going to be wearing a heavy crown if you get denied. However, at the end of the day, what is the reality that you guys are going to put into place to eliminate some of these laws? Because if I did my time, why should I be penalized when I come out and still have to wear this stripe for, excuse me, for the rest of my day saying, you know what, I made a mistake. Now I can't even compete. I can't even get to the starting game because you got a shut off or the system had a shut off. So I would really like to know what you guys are going to do for people in my boat and, again, the underserved people who are uneducated who can't compete at all. What are you guys going to do? On the, on, the edu on the education piece first, I mean, I think that we can both with, again, utilizing community college the best we can by talking to industries in the city and saying, what are your hiring needs? What are you, who are you going to be hiring? What type of people are you going to, what kind of skills do you need in the next decade of hiring? And then try to get uh, community college to tower their, their curriculum, their course offerings to those types of jobs. Uh, whether it's an associate degree or whether it's a certification, some type of welder or things of that that you need certification for. The Commerce Department, I mean, we have not had, we've had a um, kind of a participation goal effort in the city that I think has simply been symbolic when it comes to having minority, female-owned, disabled firms, uh, and, 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 and the disabled firm, of, you're, you have a, a form of a disability as a result of, the, of, your, of your record. So by, by being real serious about participation, because right now I think they call participation, but they're not serious about participation. The other thing small business people need is any technical help and any capital. And what I intend to do is take some of the deposits that we had in our city and the larger banks in the city, and redistribute not all of it, but some of it, to the smaller community banks that loan people who want to buy a house or start a business. And then have a, a, a program, not RISE, but a program dealing with this issue where we can also talk to lending institutions, both big and small, uh, to see what type of business plan and help that person put that business plan together to access the capital like every other business does and, they take a and have those companies take a chance on them also. Uh, it, it is a, you, it, there's no holistic approach to it, but when you, when you have problems that are presented to you when it comes to access or obstructions that are in people's way, then you go attack those obstructions and access. Because sometimes you never know even what, what you're facing until you run into the wall. Uh, but, but I think local institutions lending, technical assistance from the City Commerce Department and PIDC uh, and the Chamber of Commerce when it comes to putting a business plan together for a person to start a company or consulting company or some other company, uh, and then tailoring community colleges' offerings to those areas where people are more likely to get a job when they finish their when they finish their program. Now, here's the question. Okay. I'm on State Road. I don't have a GED. I can barely spell GED. Right. So community college is the farthest thing from but my mind. The other, the other part of this process is the knowing a year in advance who's coming out, potentially, and having a profile of those folks before they come out to know what it is, skills they have or don't have, what issues they're facing, and what they really want to do, and what experience they've had in life. So we, can put a, we will have kind of a, re, a life resume of that person, um, good and bad, to determine what it is we can do to address both sides of it. And that, and, that's, and that would be, if, if GED is what it is, then we have to figure out a way with our educational, our educational institutions in the city, the large ones, and with our, with our, I think building trades is a great opportunity to get people the math skills they need to pass an entry test for an apprentice program. And, they, and, and I'm going to talk to them about, and I had been talking to them about putting something together that's meaningful 
uh, so that folks can be uh, referred there and be supported there and get the things, skills that they need to move on. But it's a long, look, I'm not going to stand here and tell you I'm going to, in four years, we're going to have this problem solved. But in four years, you're going to see a much better situation than we see today. That's, that's the only commitment I can make. Will we make mistakes? Yeah. But I, but I am not too, too uh, I am humble enough to admit when we make mistakes and correct them as opposed to just going in a bad direction because it's the direction I want to go in. I'm, the, I'm a smart person, but I'm not the smartest person in the room. And once you become the smartest person in the room, you're not too smart. <laughs> So here. Uh, thank you. How you doing? Thanks for coming out. Uh, my name is Tracy L. Fisher, and I am the founder of Gateway to the Entry. Uh, I served 22 years in the federal penitentiary, and I came home and I came through RISE. Um, RISE, every re-entry program there is is a good program if they follow the mission statement. As you know, leadership starts at the top. That's what makes any program go. The leader. When you hire someone to run the funding, the mayor re-entry program, you as the mayor have to make sure that it's being done, not rubber stamp it. You have to come through there, not just when there's a program and, and, and there's a, cer a ceremony going on. You have to literally make it part of City Hall, not just say it's part of City Hall. Because when you're a leader, and you lead by example, then that's your fingerprint. That's, your, that's the essence of you. Your DNA is on that program. So whatever you stand for, that's what that program is supposed to stand for. That's why RISE has failed a lot of ex-offenders. Because the people they have running it, not because the program is not good, because any re-entry program is good if you follow the structure of it. RISE, because I'm a product of RISE, will get you a job for two days, but put on the books that you're employed. So when you look at funding and stuff, it tells the individuals that's looking at it, yes, we have employed over 200 people this month. But out of 200 people, 10 of them got a job for maybe half a month. The other ones, it's not even working no more. It might be an event down at Penn's Landing or something. And they, you pay more for your uniform to go work at a place then you do with your paycheck, then what your paycheck really is. Then they give you two tokens to get there and get back. See, that has to stop. That has to stop because I'm going to say this, then I'll let you speak. If the rise is funded over a million something plus dollars, and the only way, probably more than that, I'm just throwing the number out there. I obviously know it's in the millions though. But what I'm saying is this if we the reason, ex offenders are the reason that you can justify millions of dollars going into rise then why don't we receive any type of funding when we come home? Literally, cut all that staffing down that's not doing the job, because that's where the money's going at, instead of for helping the individuals, the male and females, that's coming home and need structure in their life. It's not a one size fit off reentry. When you come home, most of the things Rod does with reentry is this. A GED if you need one, computer class, uh, resume writing, right, uh, 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 ID, Social Security birth certificate. Okay, fine. If you need that, that's what you need. I came home, I didn't need any of that. Know what I needed? I needed someone to be there that has structure to talk to me, that's been through what I've been through, so when I get thoughts in my head about going back, doing what I did to get in there in the first place, where was that be entry at? Right. You can't have a one size fit all the entry. Right. Well, I'd appreciate your, your point of view and, your experience, and sharing your experience. Um, if I make a commitment to do something, and I think something's important, I'm going to be involved in it directly. Uh, I'm going to be involved in who gets hired there, what they do there, and what the outcomes are. Not just checking off boxes that somebody got sent to the link to clean up after an Eagles game. It, it is important. This is important to me. It's important to me that I'm successful at doing it. Because if I'm successful at doing it in the four or eight years that I'm mayor, if God willing I get there, then I'm going to really change the face of the city. I'm going to change the climate in the city. I'm going to change people's lives. I started out with that story about my friend, my young friends, because that made a difference in me. It made a difference in how I view myself as a person who can help others, who can make other lives, who make other people's lives differently. I will not stand here before you today and tell you about this story or about my ideas unless I meant to follow through with them. I, 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 I have more respect for myself. Than, than that, not just to come up here and give you platitudes and then get there and not do anything. 
I mean, obviously I'll be judged on my performance uh, if, again, I get there. But I intend to make this a critical part of this administration because it needs to be. For too long, too, too long it hasn't. And, and the, the difference that you can make in folks' lives, even if you, even if you touch one life, as I told you the story, and I've touched others, but that one life will touch and change so many others. And I'm, I, I'm a sincere believer in that. Uh, and I would not be telling you that this is going to be part, major part of my efforts unless I really meant to do it and do it for real. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank you for coming out. And the reason that I'm thanking you is that every politician campaigns. But there's a title put to this particular forum, Returning Citizens. And usually candidates will speak about that in passing because that's not their primary concern. So that's what I'm thanking you for, first and foremost. I believe uh, Secondly is this. It's a two-pronged question. Um, I'm hoping that, based on what you're sharing with us today, that you win this thing. Okay? That's the first thing. I'm hoping that because what you're voicing is things that we need to hear and activities that need to happen. Okay? But, you know, God forbid you don't get it. What can you do for us still while you're in city council, and do you intend to stay in city council? That's the first thing. I had to resign the road. Okay. I'm a, I'm a civilian. All right. Can you go back, though? I don't think I'm going back. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But I'm, I'm yeah, I, but, no, do I, look, I'm, I intend to live in the city the rest of my life. Uh, I think these things are important, and if I'm in a position where I can affect it directly, I'll certainly want to do it, as I'm promising I will. But if I'm not, I'm going to still do good in my life and do good works and try to help people. All right. So that leads to the second question I was going to ask you. Uh, in this room, uh, everybody that spoke so far, or that's here not speaking, probably belongs to some community organization that's dealing with returning citizens. I am one also. All right? Uh, this gentleman spoke about how much time he spent. I spent almost 40 years in state and federal institutions. I've been home since 2003. Had no problem whatsoever in terms of criminal activity. Have no intentions. The community organization that I represent, Reconstruction Incorporated, is a very small community. We got a little first floor office in a, in a, in a, in a house that's located in the heart of North Philly, 18 in, uh, in Tioga. And nobody knows our name. There's a million of those kind of organizations in this city that can do great work, but nobody knows their name. You know? So what could you do and would you as mayor involve community organizations in doing some of the things that you're talking about doing today? Well, after May 19th, if I'm again successful, I intend to put together a group of community people, people who are in this, who are doing this missionary work, who are doing work in the community, to get their, to get their ideas and input. I, again, I, I know what I care about. I know what my experience has been with folks who have gone astray and come back. But I don't know it all, obviously, so I need to talk to people who have worked it, who live it, and who want to make a difference in their own communities and take the advice from them, yourself included, as opposed to trying to create a program of my own with my you know, experts that probably have never <coughs> lived life or walk the walk. So I, I, I mean, the only pre people who know are the people who live it and the people who are living it. And uh, I'd be crazy not to seek out the, the advice and support of the folks in this room and the other folks that I've met in this, in this area. Uh, good afternoon. Hi, how you doing? Yes, sir. Uh, well, first, I got a couple of quick questions. I don't want to go on. I don't want to keep this going. The first one is um, dealing with an expungement. Yes. In reference to uh, your uh, legislation that, that was passed, in reference to decriminalizing small portions of marijuana, uh, if you get elected as mayor, would you look at expunging, getting the court to expunge those particular individuals who was convicted for small amounts of marijuana that's no longer on probation, will you look to uh, have those records expunged so those folks can get back into the workforce? That's one question. There, there's, there, needs, there has to be in every um, re-entry program to address this issue has to be a robust expungement process, program. Does that mean it has to be? Folks, First of all, don't know about expungement sometimes. Second, they can't afford to get a lawyer to get the expungement done. And third, they just don't know where to go. And I think that as part of a core component of any reentry program has to be a very robust expungement process involving the Bar Association, the Barristers Association, 
again, the Chamber of Commerce, you know, the Chamber has a lot of resources, and the Chamber does some good things, but the Chamber is not in area, a lot of areas where they should be if they're really truly interested in changing the, the economic climate of Philadelphia. Because it's in their best interest to have people working at jobs, they can spend money on the products they're selling. Because there's no sense in, 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 in having folks who can't afford, who don't work, who can't find a job, who don't have the skills to find a job, and are never going to be one of their customers. So if you want to, if you want to create customer base, then get some of these people back to where they need to be. Clear, clean record, trained, whatever kind of supportive services they need for the reasons they went in the first place, and an opportunity for a dignified job. It, it, understand something. I don't have the stigma about this. This is not something that I think people are bad people because they're not it's people who, for one reason or another, life did, whatever happened in their interaction with life put them someplace that they didn't want to be. That doesn't make you a bad person. It doesn't make you an evil person. It makes you a person that needs support of the community to be a, then a supportive person yourself in the community. Because I'm sure you and this gentleman and this gentleman and this gentleman are, are mentors to folks, are mentors to people who, kids who might go astray and maybe won't go astray as a result of their interaction with you. Same thing with my guy. Uh, and I'm sure there's every day you run into these folks who, who you have had a positive influence on and keep them from having a life that, you know, a life that's sad, a life that's not productive. Yes. Uh, so that's a yes? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we have politicians that have a hard time sometimes just giving yes or no answers. Uh, no, no, you want yes or no answers, I'm good. Yeah. I mean, I mean you, know, you and I already yeah. talked about this when you was pushing the, uh, the marijuana bill. We right. talked about this for the piece. And now that you may be in that driver's seat, you may get it well. Okay. One other quick question. Two quick questions. The second question is this. And it's dealing with the arbitration board. The police arbitration board. Do you have the responsibility of appointing people to the police arbitration board? I, the, the, actually, it's usually a panel of three. It's usually a panel of three, one selected by the city, one selected by the union, and one a, a neutral arbitrator. Uh, but when it comes to the, when it, look, stop and frisk is an extremely egregious program. To, I have never been stopped and frisked in my life. My 25-year-old, you know what? My 25-year-old son, who was a little younger version of me, has never been frisked in his life. An officer who feels unsafe, who feels that a person may have a weapon, has every right to pat that person down and find out if they have a weapon. But if a young man is walking from school or from his job or to her job, to his job with a backpack and he's minding his own business with his earbuds in, that doesn't mean that that person's a threat to that officer and doesn't need to be stopped and frisked. The, 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 this, the Rudy Giuliani, the Bratton you know, era of New York brought this to, 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 to bear and people think and, and police officials and other people have thought that it, it makes officers safer. In the end, I think it doesn't make them safe. No. In the end, what it does is it drives the community away from them so that they don't want to have interaction with the police. When I was 14, 15 years old, my parents would say to me, if you're in Center City and you have a hard time or trouble, or you're in another neighborhood, you don't know what's going on, you find a police officer. Because that police officer will take care of you. Well, that's not the same narrative that every young man and this woman in the city hears. And one of the goals that I have is I want them to be able to hear that narrative. We saw the other this past week this tragedy with, with with our officer, our brave officer who was killed in the line of duty by a video game for his son for his birthday. I mean, there are good police officers out there. There are good people who care about the community. And some, maybe not so good. But training in academy, continue training on the street, supervisor training on the street, sensitivity and cultural understanding. When you approach a person for the first time, that first interaction is what's going to drive the rest of that conversation for the most part. If you're polite and you look someone in the eye and you say, sir, ma'am, is there a problem? Can I help you? That's going to change the dialogue. If you come out with any other attitude other than that, it's going to change the dialogue. You're less safe if you approach people in that manner. And I think that's a, that's a continuing education process. It's also an important selection process when we're recruiting police to do that kind of advanced understanding of what they're thinking up there before they actually get a badge and a gun. And I think that we can, we can help move that situation along. Look, we've had problems all over the country. And Chief Ramsey, who's a good man and a good police commissioner, is, being invo is involved with President Obama's efforts to reform this stuff and to have a different dialogue about things. But I, I think despite the problems we have here in the city, and we see them popping up from time to time, and they're tragic and they're sad, I think we're not, we're not those other cities. And I think we, we are, we're a lot further ahead of them, but could get much better than we are now. 
Hi, Mr. Kenny. Hi, my name is Karen Lee. I'm a member of the Human Rights Coalition here in Philadelphia and also incarcerate PA. Uh, you may defer to answer this question, but if you do, that's, that's okay too. Um, Sergeant Brandon Ruff was an eight year police uh, veteran uh, sergeant. He made a claim, he filed a suit, a, a suit against police, uh, of police brutality. And in his suit, he alleged that the, the department encourages, encourages and tolerates officers who misrepresent facts in order to establish probable cause and allows officers to have persons falsely arrested or maliciously prosecuted. As the mayor, do you have any plans to address the lack of accountability and the lack of transparency that is now inherent in the police department? Well, I think, I mean, obviously transparency, sunlight, sunlight cures a lot of infection. Um, so the, the more transparent something is, the better it is for everybody. Uh, one of the reasons, again, that, that the marijuana decriminalization came into effect or came, in, it came an impact is because you are correct. Officers were sometimes using that small amount of marijuana to 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 incarcerate, to lock up, and then question someone on other things. That's not an appropriate way of policing. Um, I'm going to select a police commissioner that is sensitive to those issues. A uh, police commissioner that uh, is sensitive to both the community and and the safety of his officers. Uh, and I think that the, the the more open we are with the public, the more the public trusts us, the more the public trusts the police. I mean, if you have you have you know you have officers in your community that that have been there for a long time, that have developed that trust with people, that people people like and trust and will speak to, uh, and, and know that they're out there to have, to have the citizens back. You, we all know officers in our communities that are like that, and we know the other type. We're, we're going to work on both. But I don't, I don't know if I, I probably didn't answer your question the way you're... Not really, but I'm at the start. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> He's on the time, though. He's on the time, though.